Jenkins, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins. I am the uh, founder and chair of the uh, Women of Color Events in Peace, Security, and Conflict Transformation. Um, I'm very happy to uh, welcome all of you to this discussion uh, for our first edition. And I say first edition because we do want to have future editions in the future um, of our first Women of Color uh, paper uh, policy papers. And why we decided to do this is because we really see that there are so many issues in the peace and security field that affect women of color uh, predominantly. And it's an opportunity to hear from some women of color um, and allies on these issues uh, to get their perspectives on uh, the status of uh, policies and also, of course, important recommendations for where we should go and how we should go forward. Um, and as we're seeing now with the infectious disease issues, COVID-19, it's an understanding and recognition that there's a lot of issues that we should be thinking about and we as a global community should be concerned about. Um, and what is great about the policy papers is that they really do look at a number of issues and connections between issues. Um, and so having an opportunity to hear from um, women of color and their perspectives, I think is very important. And that's why we wanna keep doing this. Uh, we're hoping to have another policy paper uh, edition, certainly before the end of the year. Um, and so we will be looking for uh, future authors who want to write on issues of policy in the peace and security and conflict transformation fields and ideas for ways in which we should go forward, which I think is particularly important as we are in an election year. Um, as most of you know, WCAPS was established in 2017, and really the vision uh, has been several. Um, of course, developing a network of women of color who work on issues of peace, security, and conflict transformation to provide uh, a space for uh, women of color to have conversations um, and also to try to see how we can improve the representation of women of color in government, outside government, academia, think tank, wherever, uh, so that we can have an impact on policy. But also the recognition that to be in those spaces, we also have to think about the pipeline of, of women and young girls. And so we also do a number of things, including something called the pipeline program, where we do uh, focus on young girls and, uh, and early career um, women to help the pipeline and also mid-career to keep people going through the pipeline to make sure that we can actually get to those places at high level where we can also impact policy as well. Um, the edition that came out, uh, policy papers, and I, I sent all of you uh, a connection to it uh, yesterday when I sent out the, e the email with the Zoom uh, call-in, but I also sent the other edition that we came out with, which is the top policy issues, uh, top three policy issues uh, concerning women of color in the United States. What I did not send because it's a little too thick and would take too long to get through is uh, uh, another publication that really is the synopsis of the meeting that we held in July last year. And if you go to the website, wcaps.org, wcaps.org, you will see this as well. It's a very, it's a much thicker document, but it really is also some very good information on um, panels that were discussed and information that came from the panel. So I would also recommend you to look at that. Um, just want to also just to start out by saying, um, you know, one of the fundamental uh, things that we do here, in addition to a number of programs that I hope that you will have a chance to see or experience, um, either going to the website and looking through all our activities or to join us in some of our, our, our work, um, is we, we started uh, at the very beginning something called Redefining National Security. And that's the first uh, paper that you see in, in, the, in the publication. And uh, that theme really underpins a lot of the work that we do in WCAPS because what, it, what it's doing is asking um, questions that relate to how we define national security. And the reason why we do that is because so much of what is in considered national security drives a lot of what a lot of what we do in the United States are policies, the funding that follows those policies. And uh, the question really is, does that, the, is the way that we define it really accurately capturing the root, the threats that we really face today, either as a global community or as individuals who are, who have different cultures and different backgrounds in America? 
um, so re really relevant right now, I mean, is infectious disease, has that been really considered an issue of national security? And it has not been as much as it should have been um, in the past. So we've had people make the connection, but not significantly. And I think we're seeing now how something like COVID-19 does really affect our security, our national security. But there are other issues that are reflected in the papers that are captured by our authors that really also talk about things like food security and climate uh, change and, and cyber security and you know a host of other issues that are have been traditionally considered human security issues, um, and but they also are national security issues. They're, they're issues that really can affect us in ways that we may not understand or predict, and unfortunately won't know until it hits us, unless we can think differently and plan differently, which obviously we have not done enough in the area of infectious disease. So because so many of these issues affect women of color predominantly, it's an important part of our work of WCAPS, which looks at all these issues of peace and security and conflict. Um, and so that's why this area of redefining national security really does underpin a lot of the work. And I've done uh, some, several writings on that and it is uh, in the uh, policy papers. Um, so I welcome you to uh, read that as well as you take advantage of the great work that's done by all of the policy paper authors who you'll be hearing from today. Um, so each one of our authors will take about five minutes. They'll talk a little bit about their paper, what they wrote, um, some background on the policy and their recommendations and why these issues are important for a global community um, and also why they are important for women of color. Um, and without further ado, um, I'm going to ask April Arnold to uh, present her paper to talk a little bit about what she covered um, and what it, how the issue that she discusses on religion affects uh, women of color and also all of us. So April, turn over to you. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it, um, both to publish and to speak on it. So I wrote my paper, which focuses on um, the role of religion in US foreign policy. Um, basically, I saw that religion was playing a more direct factor in conflict, both, dom both domestically and um, internationally, whether it be through war or uh, through pro protests, and wanted to see if there was a way that we could better engage the government um, to help with these matters while not formally endorsing any particular religion. Um, as for the impact on women, studies show that women typically are, are more devout to their faiths, and of course that is contingent on the definition of devout, but they are closely tied to their faith communities. And so perhaps one of the best ways to promote women and women of color and, and women um, in the minority, whether it's religious minority, uh, in their communities is perhaps through the gatekeepers of their, their faith communities. Um, some of my recommendations, or all of them, focus on really reestablishing or, or solidifying roles that are already existing in the government. So I'm not really looking to start something new because uh, budget, <laughs> we just, um, you know, with the issues with the economy, with the issues with COVID, the reality is money is a very important factor right now and we can't just make willy nilly recommendations but have to be very practical. So my recommendations include um, filling a, a NSC role or National Security Council role um, that was established through the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998 um, to help with matters related to immigration. I mean, we had the, the travel ban that many were concerned was um, prejudiced towards Muslims. Um, we also have countering violent extremism. How do we address those matters from a religious perspective without promoting certain parts of religions and picking and choosing? Having someone that's focused on that role of, of religious freedom can focus on those problems and really be a voice for those communities. Um, second recommendation was um, expanding the role of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and um, promoting the role of the ambassador at large in that commission, as that would help with, again, bringing a voice to key negotiations. A uh, quick example of that, a, a minor example, is um, having the ambassador mention the Pope has in 
end of last year mentioned um, nuclear security and he, he believes that nuclear weapons are immoral. That's a great point to negotiate with other countries as we look at uh, nuclear treaties. And then thirdly, um, expanding the role of the military chaplain in conflict zones, especially to establish stability between relationships of the soldiers and uh, the community. All of these help with really just building relationships when relationships are most important. Um, each of these have been, again, initiated. They've been uh, started, but they haven't been carried to their fullest potential. And I think that that can be done. Um, while these recommendations don't specifically focus on women, I think just establishing the structure is what will help eventually get to the point where we can direct or more directly focus on um, dealing with issues that relate to women of color, such as ho social hostility, gender-based violence um, under the guise of, of religion, um, and really be able to promote women in their faith communities. Um, there are a couple issues. I think the main one is um, how do you do that without promoting one particular religion? Um, there are ways. I think that they're in their infancy, but I think that if we put the right resources to it, we could actually truly um, make some, some headway in this. So that's all I have. Thank you. I forgot to also ask that you introduce yourselves in terms of uh, your background and, and I could read it, but I'd much rather have all of you say a little, about, a little bit about yourself. So if you don't mind saying a bit, April. Right, sorry about that. Uh, my name is April. I'm a man management consultant by day. I actually focus on arms control, specifically um, chemical weapons convention. Um, and I enjoy studying religion. It's one of my passions and when I started noticing that there were religious leaders speaking on these matters and that they did have something to say, I thought it would be interesting to put forth some recommendations that I see. Um, but I'm a local person, local to DC, um, grew up in the Maryland area, so. Great, thanks April. Okay, Yuri Lee, could you say a little bit about your paper on food security, climate change and migration? Sure. Um... Hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Yuri. I uh, am currently working as an international trade analyst with um, a Department of Homeland Security uh, and uh, researching forced labor in, in global supply chains. Um, and But my background is more um, what informs uh, the paper that I wrote on, on food security and, and climate change. Um, and migration, uh, because I come from more of an international development um, type of background. And I had uh, worked previously with um, coffee farm, small coffee farmers in Colombia who were uh, affected by an outbreak of a, of a disease um, along their coffee plants that are specific or, or has become more prevalent due to climate change related factors. Um, and I had also, um, previously served in the Peace Corps in El Salvador during um, 2014 to 16, when it was particularly um, a hard time for the for the small farmers there, uh, experiencing um, unseasonal drought during the the uh, during the rainy season, for example, and so um, and so as a way to relate to the ongoing um, immigration uh, policy discussions and uh, kind of the crisis that we were seeing at the at the southern border, um, I wanted to examine more of the root causes for what push people to leave their home countries. Um, and uh, it, it just so happened that I came across uh, this study by the World Food Program that had assessed the uh, food security situation uh, in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador um, in a particular region called the Dry Corridor, which is known to be uh, very dependent on agriculture uh, for livelihoods and also as particularly vulnerable to climate change related uh, impacts. And so, um, and this, you know, 
the study basically found that um, a strong push factor or perhaps the the tipping point um, was was actually food insecurity rather than um, just you know the kind of often cited um, violence and you know homicide rates that we're seeing uh, in the Central American region. And so it was really um, that with a high uh, dependence on on agriculture for their livelihoods and being unable to um, to uh, provide for their families um, through both uh, on farm income and off farm income sources during the lean seasons. Um, combined with uh, threats from um, from urban areas as well uh, that make um, staying in the country harder to to um, to accomplish. And so um, women also are disproportionately impacted by uh, climate change. Um, effects in rural areas. Um, so we see that women have to travel further to uh, get water or firewood um, and are also, that causes a de uh, uh, demands uh, that compete with their time for other um, tasks that they might be culturally um, tasked with or uh, also for, um, they've been increasingly um, uh, uh, loaded with farm work as well as uh, men have tended to um, migrate in larger numbers. But as we've seen in recent years, um, there were increasingly uh, increasing numbers of women and children migrating um, and, uh, and indigenous uh, peoples that had not previously been seen um, in the border area. And so, um, I wanted to create more of a, a context for, for why people are pushed to leave and, and that women are particularly um, at, at risk um, as they uh, deal with the effects of climate change. And so my recommendations uh, were to um, target international aid uh, to help people through the lean seasons um, and to create more of a cohesive uh, immigration policy discussion that includes food security as um, a major push factor and uh, something that makes people um, more, more vulnerable to other threats that include um, uh, physical threats to their safety as well as kind of more uh, environmental threats. Great, thank you, Yuri. Um, so next we have Camille Moore, who worked on a topic and wrote about woman, woman, woman economics. I always have a hard time saying that word. <laughs> um, and water management. You can introduce yourself and uh, tell us a bit about your paper and your and your uh, recommendations. Good morning, Ambassador. And it, it's womanomics, and I think it took me, yeah, a little bit to actually get that that phraseology down. But good morning, everybody. I want to say a huge thank you to WCAPS, to Ambassador Jenkins, to Nita, and also to Rudra. Um, I'm really, really excited to be a part of this first journal on this amazing uh, panel with um, very forward-thinking women policy experts. So it's great to be considered to be a part of this group. Um, I also want to say a big shout out to the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, um, with whom I'm a fellow. Um, so if any of the policy fellows are also here viewing, hi. If you are from Oakwood University, my HBCU alma mater, um, and you're also joining, hello, um, as well as the commission um, where I am actually stationed as a fellow. So my name is Camille Moore. I received my um, Masters of Science in Public Policy and Management from Carnegie Mellon University. So also shout out if you are from CMU and you're watching this. Um, right now I am a CBCF fellow, policy fellow, and my designation is in within energy. So um, I actually come from a workforce development background and those are the issues that I have covered on the Hill. 
And in the second part of this fellowship, I've actually joined the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, otherwise known as the CSCE. That is actually the world's largest regional security organization. And so what we have are three different buckets. There's economics and environment, which is the second dimension. We have human rights, which is the first dimension. And the third dimension, excuse me, and the very first is um, your political strategic or your military bucket. So what I've been able to do for the last 12 months is really look at security from a very comprehensive um, perspective. So what WCAPS is doing is I think very, very important, putting human, um, more human context into our security discussions is completely important because I don't think there's one paper that's in this um, that's in this journal that is not cross-sectional and doesn't affect more than one industry or sector. So Womenomics and Water Management is the paper that I wrote. Um, I'm actually newer to water issues. It's something that I was introduced to in Vienna with the commission. Um, this past year, the Economics and Environment Forum actually focused on water diplomacy. And so you got to hear a lot of countries and a lot of city development experts talk about SDG 6. And Sustainable Development Goal 6 um, deals exclusively with clean water access, with um, equitable access, with affordability, and basically the, the universal human right to clean water. So womanomics and water management, I'd say, is a mixture of women being included in um, economic development and water management. Um, from a lot of research, we see that water management is a key solution in the freshwater crisis that we're experiencing. So freshwater, um, the world is covered in 70% water, but only about 2.5% of that water is actually fresh, water that we can actually consume, reuse, reuse, um, reduce exposure to outside um, things that would exploit it and also reduce our use of fresh water. So agriculture is actually an industry um, that consumes about 80% of our freshwater resources and energy production is actually second after agriculture with about 48, maybe 50% of water usage. So as our populations grow, as our cities become larger, and as people actually um, do economically better, we see the same correlation in people becoming economically enfranchised and using more energy, and they also use more water. Unfortunately, we use a lot of water to produce our energy. So with the increase of droughts, um, with the increase, with, with the aging water infrastructure that we have in this country and also around the globe, we are facing real issues when it comes to how we manage our fresh water resources. So, um, you know, a prompt for this paper was to focus on the experiences of women of color. And undoubtedly, women experience water scarcity drastically different than men do. Um, women of color experience water scarcity completely differently than women maybe in more developed countries, um, and women who are in um, maybe more, if you will, the global north. This is because of three things, access, affordability, and further ex exposure to social ills. So those three things together, we're thinking about what real solutions exist when it comes to managing freshwater resources more responsibly. Um, so, this was a very interesting fact that um, kind of came up in, the, in my research. Annually, Americans themselves, we waste about 2.1 trillion gallons of water every year. And 2.1 trillion gallons is about 48 billion baths. It is also 80 billion swimming pools filled up. So a lot of that, um, you could say it's a lot of different things. We are experiencing droughts longer than we have before, so that's a climate change argument. We also have policies instated that were set up with the, 
with the understanding that fresh water was an abundant resource rather than it being something scarce. Um, and the third is that we also have infrastructure loss. So leaks, leaky pipes, that is actually one of the number one things that we can change to keep and conserve our fresh water. So how does womenomics play a role in all of this? Well, when it comes to access, affordability, and exposure to further social ills due to water scarcity, women can be our secret weapon. So there is a lot of research out there that talks about involving women not only in managerial roles, but also putting them in more technical roles. Across the globe, um, the World Bank Group um, in its research entitled Women in Water, Breaking Barriers, they found that less than one in five women is actually represented in the water sector, and that's globally. Um, those numbers are a little better in, if you will, developed countries, but we need more women in water. Why? Women, when we see them in technical roles, managerial roles, the, the answer is clear. Um, women, um, saw, we saw an improvement in budgets. When women were part of water management, we saw a decrease in shortages or outages, um, the occurrence of the likelihood of those happening. Um, accounting also improved. And we also saw more consistent meetings, which I thought was a great uh, improvement for, for um, water management. But basically the recommendations that come out of this paper are number one for us to, um, the first recommendation is to further examine um, what is happening at our local levels. Um, so whether that's rural or urban, I know in the paper I focus more on rural, but really making sure that we have women as a part of the discussion. Even if they're brought in in the more technical roles, we see women quickly moving up those ranks to becoming managers, to becoming part of the leadership boards, um, to furthering, um, furthering their tenure within the water sector. Number two, was to more closely examine the link between women and climate change, which we come to find out, um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee has actually introduced a bill that will um, produce just the committee, the committee that will focus just on that issue. Um, so that bill is very important, I think, to, to highlight. And also in more recent, um, I know that this paper was submitted somewhere in September, but um, the commission actually before um, this coronavirus outbreak was looking to put together um, a hearing that would focus specifically on women, water, and the warming climate. Um, that is something that has not happened quite yet, but we have in the works with some of our commissioners um, the furtherance of some sort of agenda, um, or even just the furtherance of a discussion that would focus on um, looking at freshwater resources more seriously. Um, we know that climate change has a disproportionate, um, will have a disproportionate impact on women, especially women of color, families of color, communities of color. Um, so thinking more seriously about the water that runs from our tap, even in times of crisis, you know, we are going through an outbreak, but we are very fortunate to still have um, running water, we have electricity, we have sewer, all of those things that actually allow us to stay home. So um, those are the things that I focused on and I would love to answer more questions about women in the water sector, women in the um, sanitation and hygiene sector. Um, and if you have any questions about the water industry's response to coronavirus, I'd also love to answer those questions. So thank you. Ambassador, I think you're muted. Thanks, I keep forgetting when I mute, when I don't mute. Okay, so uh, first I wanna say thank you, Camille. Um, and then uh, we're gonna have our next presentation was actually written by four of our authors um, on information operations targeting US elections. And I'm gonna be asking Princess Harris and Kendra Brown to say uh, a bit about the papers and say a bit about themselves, thanks. 
I guess, Princess, you can go first. Yes. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Princess uh, Maiden Name Harris, uh, last name Ephon. Um, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to speak with everyone um, today um, about the, the paper that um, I co-authored um, along with Kendra um, and some of the other panelists. Um, so a little bit about myself. I am one of the newer members to the WCAPS um, policy group. Um, I had some outreach and connection last fall that posed this opportunity to reflect on lessons that were at risk of being missed as we um, run up to the next election and to really reflect on some of the experiences that I've had um, both within government and then academically just thinking about um, information operations, election integrity. Um, so I'll do a little bit about myself. and I think I'll also have Kendra introduce um, herself and then I think we can probably piggyback on some of the highlights from the paper um, that we want to share with everyone. So just very quick for me, um, 12 years working in federal government, I had transitioned um, to now being in a management consulting um, practice. Um, my experience spans quite a bit um, across the interagency and national security issues. I'm working previously in, in the intelligence community, Department of Defense, um, spent quite a bit of time in international development, and international affairs, and also supporting a lot of global diplomacy issues, um, working on conflict issues, peace issues, um, and particularly those uh, disparities that impact communities of, of color. Um, so I'll stop there and then um, Kendra over to you and I guess key highlights from the paper. Sure, thank you so much, Princess. Um, so I am Kendra Brown. I'm currently Director of Public Policy at MasterCard. Um, I joined MasterCard in March um, and I came from the Hill. I was a Chief of Staff um, in uh, the House of Representatives. Prior to that, um, I was Senior Director of Diversity, Inclusion and Affinity at American University Washington College of Law. And so I've done um, a lot of work in the area um, of equity, um, of affinities um, and um, diversity and um, inclusion. Prior to that, I was also the Policy Director for the Congressional Black Caucus. And so um, am acutely aware of a lot of the disparities that continue to exist um, and have been working for years um, on legislative um, remedies, um, policies and initiatives that can further um, the equity gaps that we see and also to move individuals forward in the national security space so that we can ensure that communities of color, um, that their perspectives are at the table. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. So I look forward to speaking with Princess and sharing with you. Great. Uh, does anyone want to, is, uh, I know that, is Sean here? I did want to introduce, I don't think Sean is on the line. No. Um, but uh, did either one of you want to talk a little bit about the paper? Sure, sure. So um, is Princess still there? I don't see her, but I will, I, I will talk uh, about the paper. Um, so understanding um, that information operations have targeted our elections. Um, we drafted the paper to set out policy recommendations and recommendations that advocacy groups can set forward uh, for consideration um, to ensure, hey, okay, okay, there you are. Um, so as we approach the 2020 election, um, it is clear that, of course, for intelligence um, services efforts continue to shape public opinion, um, and there are um, a lot of um, efforts that are underway um, that are false, um, and we want to ensure that we set forth recommendations um, and fully analyze um, what is happening um, because there is a lot of malicious social media activity that still continues. Um, we want to ensure that advocates, policymakers, and candidates um, also can consider the potential identification of specific entities um, in the U.S. and also abroad um, that are responsible for bad faith exploitation, specifically of a racial inequity. We saw that happen. We've continued to see that happen. And so the recommendations that we share um, seek to set forth remedies uh, for those particular happenings, again, that continue to occur. 
Um, and with that, I'll toss it over to the princess um, and then I can speak again. Um, so princess, if you want to share additional information. Yes, sure. Um, I think one of the findings that we had in terms of uh, prioritizing the recommendations um, and I thought was really important for us to put forward was the fundamental um, and critical step in acknowledging, you know, the spotted pass. Um, mm -hmm. You see a lot of energy and resources put and directed towards threat actors, whether it be Russia previously, and the landscape is quite diverse now, um, but you don't see as much power coming into those conversations and information spaces if the the fact like the threat of fact um, isn't something that's active in the discourse so policymakers advocates not tackling that thread of truth at the forefront um, only helps to amplify the effectiveness of um, those threat actors so putting first and foremost um, addressing the underlying issue, addressing those histories, um, and then equipping teams and um, policy circles and research um, and leveraging the community of resources around what's happening. Um, the media landscape has been really flattened um, in this um, day and age around information flow. Um, so failing to own your part and to recognize who all is shaping the information space um, was also something else that we wanted to emphasize is important. It's not just what others are doing, it's are you doing your part to um, edify and um, empower communities to understand what's at stake, um, what's going to be done differently to protect them um, and to allay any concerns that they have around things that are of utmost importance to them individually and at a community level. So I would say that was one of the one things that um, I felt really great about us being able to amplify through the paper um, and thinking globally, this is a repeated pattern that you see with governments that are struggling to reach those most marginalized groups if you're unwilling to exercise some humility um, and address your own um, contributions to these historical grievances, if you will. It doesn't matter how effective the, the countermeasures may be. Um, those groups still have those experiences that have not been met directly um, and compassionately by the government that they're looking to um, provide services and protection. So that would be one um, critical threat that even in this landscape of COVID-19, um, as we go into the next election year, further amplifies and emphasizes the importance of them showing up. I absolutely agree. And um, I think that um, some of the, in addition to what Princess was saying, um, one of the key recommendations um, is to be one part advocate, one part threat analyst, um, just in ensuring that um, individuals understand that the disproportionate signal um, boosting um, and retweeting of specific hashtags, um, for example, in participation of suspect social media accounts should be accounted for, um, you know, in political messaging so that information and operations content um, is not inadvertently disregarded um, or repackaged for voter audiences. And um, we see that that, you know, is something that is still happening. Um, and so I think that is um, a very specific uh, recommendation that we had also also use outreach to empower and emphasize ballot access. I know there are, are um, a, there's a lot happening in the COVID-19 space because of the implications of um, individuals um, having to social distance um, uh, while voting. And so this is, um, as Princess said, it's another layer that is set on top of um, you know, what's happening in elections across the country. So there are a lot of different um, considerations that must be brought to bear at this time and really encourage you to look at our recommendations. And um, you know, if you have any questions, let us know. But these are some of the um, recommendations that we brought forward because we continue to see that um, the interference is still there and um, seeking to really um, divide um, based upon the racial inequity that has existed in our country um, for so, so long. And so that was why we thought that this was such a critical topic uh, to present on and we do welcome questions. 
Thank you, Kendra. Thank you, Princess. Sure. Um, the other author uh, was Sean Shank, who's not here. He's the Vice President of Cyber Threat Intelligence at BNY Mellon. And the fourth author, um, who is going to be speaking now, is Sayoko Quinlan. And she also wrote a paper uh, separately as well on mitigating the negative impact of automation and general artificial intelligence for communities underrepresented in the industry. So Sayoko, over to you. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, WCAPS, for hosting this event. My name is Sayako Quinlan. I am a consultant in the cybersecurity space, and I'm also at WCAPS, the lead of the Artificial Intelligence or AI Working Group, or Small Working Group. I have leveraged and studied artificial intelligence, particularly machine learning in academia, at my job, as well as as a hobbyist in my own time. Prior to drafting up this paper, I had been familiar with concepts such as, or realities such as the underrepresentation of people of color and women, the impact of job displacement and algorithmic discrimination within artificial intelligence. However, around the time of the proposal period, WCAPS had an event named AI Hyperreality with Dr. Lure Danley and a group of us had a discussion after about the various issues and I was aware as a small working group lead for AI that a paper around AI and its impact on communities of color and women was going to be a goal of mine. And one major issue that came up as we were having this discussion after the event was that policy tends to jump the gun before involving the appropriate stakeholders. And so with that in mind, I started to draft up that policy proposal. Looking at the ideal audience, um, this policy paper is focused on the United States, but I think the key concept of involving key stakeholders is applicable globally. The paper identified the Networking and Information Technology Research and Development Organization, also known as NITRD, and they have developed, um, along with other folks under the executive branch a, and legislative branch, the federal strategy for artificial intelligence. It was most recently updated in 2019. And reading through that document, I noticed that they did mention, of course, the risk of job displacement with the implementation of artificial intelligence and the importance of training a workforce uh, for that growing field, but they did not expand much on how that technology disproportionately affects certain demographics, particularly women and people of color. And they didn't identify the targeted need for education in those communities. I think it was also advantageous to look at a group like NITRD because they are a federally funded research and development program. They're not an agency and they do have a unique role of supporting outreach from the government to academia and industry. And this reminded me of the organization MITRE who actually Dr. Lord Danley came from. In the cybersecurity space, MITRE has a really great reputation of working with the industry as well as the government to foster common language and an end goal of improved security within our space. And so, I see an ITRD of able to occupy that same role within artificial intelligence where a lot of the innovation and arguably um, the excellence lies in the private sector. The recommendation for the paper reads as an ITRD should convene a committee of stakeholders from the top three industries where an RTRD predicts that AI would cause the most job displacement the community must include representatives from groups, particularly communities of color and women, which would be economically harmed by the implementation of AI. The goal of the committee should be to provide recommendations to incorporate into the National Artificial Intelligence Research and Development Strategic Plan that maximize the inclusion of communities that are underrepresented in the artificial intelligence industry. And this document should provide a strategy for AI that benefits those communities. In this document, I intentionally did not provide any recommendations because tying back to that conversation we had at the end of that WCAPS event, I think that recommendations 
for that strategy should be generated within that group because even the group of us as diverse as we were in the WCAPS uh, uh, event discussion, we were not. I just knew that there would be items that I would leave out and that just further underscores the need for convening a group of people to come up with a strategy. That being said, I do see definitely key benefits, particularly to national security with having a group like this brought together and develop a set of recommendations and strategy. As mentioned, one of the top priorities would be that impact on job displacement and how the United States as an inclusive organization can counter how artificial intelligence may economically hurt communities of color and women. In addition, there is a huge benefit of improving our artificial intelligence innovation. There has been tons of research on how more diverse teams, one, just work better, but as well improve artificial intelligence and the modeling there. With the different applications of artificial intelligence, this could mean, for example, in the military, in the paper we quote one instance where the military is developing drones that target individuals based on their face, facial recognition. And it is known that facial recognition technology is severely inaccurate or disproportionate, strongly disproportionately inaccurate when looking at people of color and women and particularly women of color. To countries where people don't look white and if you have the risk of misidentifying people that could have serious national security consequences. Secondly, the economy. We are in a AI race and as a country that is as diverse as we are, our ability to leverage that diversity has huge benefits in improving our artificial intelligence innovation. All right, thank you all. Great, thank you for that. Very helpful. Okay, so now we're going to turn to Stephanie Ayoko, uh, who's going to talk about transportation equity, the shared eclectic, electric and the autonomous transportation revolution. Stephanie? Yeah, you have to. Oh, there it is. I'm unmuted. Hi, okay. all. Hi. Good morning. Um, my name is Stephanie Yoko. I'm a recent graduate of Johns Hopkins Sice um, School of Advanced International Studies, where I studied energy resources and the environment. Um, I currently work for an investment firm where um, I basically help them map out transportation technologies around the world. Um, and the reason I picked this issue, um, I think first and foremost that the US is in dire need of uh, infrastructure investments, especially towards our crumbling tr transport sector. Um, and these investments can look anything from roads, pedestrian walkways, and then investing in electric fleets. Secondly, I am also a firm believer that cities need to be livable and transport planning decisions um, have significant equity impacts on people's livelihood um, and also job prospects. But I think the, the, the sort of key thing here is that transport is costly, it's regressive. And um, if we're considering climate change, which we should, transport is the largest, um, is the third largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, which as we all know, have increased global temperatures by around 1% since industrial, pre-industrial times. So this and amongst other things make automobile um, and transport oriented solutions absolutely necessary. However, sometimes transport oriented solutions create additional equity problems. So in this paper, I outlined three transportation equity issues that need to be at the center of transport discussions, um, especially regarding shared electric autonomous and connected vehicles. Um, issue number one that I highlighted in this paper um, is that I don't believe that, and, and studies prove that disadvantaged um, communities are not necessarily engaged in local conversations about shared mobility, electric vehicle for affordability, and the future of autonomous vehicles. Um, and I think that one way that we can really hone in in, in, in addressing these issues um, is creating a mobility equity framework, particularly through the Department of Transportation. And I think through that, we can task the working group 
with researching, supporting, and advocating projects that ensure that the benefits of autonomous vehicles are distributed fairly, um, which include uh, you know, inviting pilot driverless vehicle companies to drive um, in poor neighborhoods, but also hosting fairs and events which display the electric vehicle tax credits and other subsidies that are available to different types of communities. Um, secondly, disadvantaged communities also face financial, technological, and language barriers in using shared mobility platforms. And, you know, shared mobility platform applications often require people to have smartphone access, banking access, and internet access. But there's a concern, there's a large population of people who are not including, do not have access to these types of technologies. So I think that um, in a, right now, you're seeing a lot of cities have different requests for micromobility companies. I think they should have similar requests um, for um, the, like the Ubers and Lyfts to ensure that companies are eager to, um, who want to expand in these neighborhoods, develop platforms for households that don't have access to banking um, or online payment systems. And I think the third and probably the most important one is the congestion and air pollution. Um, it, it's already said that um, air pollution uh, may increase because of autonomous vehicles and have increased um, in, in some parts of the country because of shared mobility platforms. This is important because, you know, geographic analysis have determined that lower income and minority communities contain an excessive portion of undesirable transportation facilities, such as the highways that we have, and then also freight terminals. And I think the best way to sort of fix these types of issues, um, in addition to obviously incentivizing EV uptake, is supporting the um, installation, maintenance of electric vehicle charging infrastructure in parts of the city, including in the disadvantaged communities, but also increasing the uptake, um, the um, at cleaning up the roads and then pedestrian walkways for bike usage. Um, I think just in, in, in thinking about a livable um, community and especially around the time whenever we're, we are finding, we are, we are sort of strategizing on ways that we can improve infrastructure in the state. I think that transportation needs to be at the center of this um, conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Stephanie, I appreciate that. Um, so the next one is uh, actually one that I wrote and it's on, um, it's basically looking at um, where we are now with our arms control um, and non-proliferation uh, situation. And it's really calling for the United States to have a arms control and non-proliferation policy and to have a better strategy of how we're trying to deal with issues of weapons of mass destruction. Um, uh, the three cases I really look at are familiar to, to you. Um, one is the situation with something called the New START Treaty, the Strategic Arm Reduction Treaty, which is a treaty between the US and Russia, um, which was entered into force in 2011. And this is the last treaty that we have with Russia, the last bilateral treaty uh, on arms control. Um, as you probably know, we recently withdrew from the international, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which is a treaty that um, was very successful in eliminating a medium range uh, nuclear uh, strategic, um, strategic weapons in Europe. Um, and we withdrew from that. And um, there have been a number of actions that the US has done um, that has indicated uh, a turning away from traditional uh, work that we have done in arms control. And that's one of them. And the problem now is that the treaty will expire next year if it's not extended. And if it's, if it's not extended, then the last, that will be the last treaty that we have with Russia um, on these um, nuclear weapons issues, on arms control issues, after having a multitude of treaties with Russia, um, even during, obviously during the Cold War, when we negotiate a lot of treaties. So um, the arms control community is very concerned about this and the fact that the US has not shown any strategy or interest in really extending the treaty, uh, which will expire very soon. And the thing is the treaty does not need to be um, ratified again. It can be just extended by the administration. Um, so there's no need to go back to the Senate for ratification, but it, um, it obviously is an important treaty because it does reduce and limited uh, strategic weapons, um, strategic arms. Um, and so there's a real desire to extend it, but unfortunately we haven't, and we're running out of time. 
The second case is the Iran situation, which many of you have heard a lot about and know about, the Joint Communist Plan of Action, which was agreed to, um, and under the Obama administration, which President Trump withdrew from, um, and is the only country to withdraw from the treaty that had uh, uh, Russia, China, the UK, France, um, the European Union's involved, um, uh, and um, it, there's been a lot of blowback from that, obviously, and a lot of problems because of the fact that Iran was abiding by the treaty, which was essentially uh, creating a situation where they could not develop nuclear weapons. And that has had a host of um, uh, repercussions with the other parties uh, really trying to stay in the treaty, trying to keep Iran in the treaty. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of issues uh, with Iran, um, not necessarily directly related to the treaty, but the treaty and not having it and not have, well, well, the agreement, not a treaty, the agreement, not having the US part of the agreement has meant that we have uh, reinstated sanctions on Iran that we had taken away because of the agreement. Um, and so that has created a lot of tensions um, with Iran and the US. And then the third case is North Korea. Um, everyone's aware of that. The fact that our talks that we had been hoping would lead to something has not really led to any changes in North Korea's nuclear situation. It has not led to North Korea taking any steps to get rid of its nuclear weapons. Um, and there was a lot of euphoria and happiness and, and, hope, and hope when we had the summits uh, between US and North Korea. Um, but uh, for a number of reasons, uh, many of them um, highly predictable, it did not lead to any success, mainly because there was not a real significant uh, plan or strategy put into place to determine how, in fact, North Korea would go about taking the steps to get rid of its nuclear weapons, nor was there an effort really to understand how in the process by which the US would reduce sanctions on North Korea, which is what North Korea really wanted. So since those steps were never taken, despite the pomp and circumstance surrounding the meetings and the summits, it did not lead to much. And that was because we did not put much into it when we started. Um, so what we have now is a rather kind of haphazard situation where we have treaties we've withdrawn from or agreements we've withdrawn from, treaties we've withdrawn from, um, situations that were not really seriously taken where we had opportunities. Uh, and so a big question right now in the arms control nonproliferation community is what is the future of um, arms control and nonproliferation. There was supposed to be a nonproliferation treaty review conference this year, uh, this time. Uh, right now in New York, which was obviously postponed because of coronavirus. Um, and so that might have been bad for the US if there was a meeting because there's a lot that um, we would have to explain at a, a meeting of the over 180 countries who are part of the nonproliferation treaty uh, about the steps that we have taken recently that do not show um, a situation where we are taking steps to that can be viewed as nonproliferation, but actually taking steps that are going the other way. A lot more to talk about that. Um, the last one of the recommendations I do talk about is China. Um, in addition to some of the other things about, you know, consider going back to the JCPOA, um, that we should have a strategy, that we should obviously ratify, I mean, that we should obviously extend the START Treaty, but also the fact that Russia, that the US wants China to be involved in negotiations and China has no interest in being involved in negotiations, at least, um, you know, not at this time. Um, there may be ways to get them involved in, in any kind of arms control, but right now, since the US and Russia have so many more nuclear weapons than China, their attitude is, well, when you get down to our level, maybe we'll start talking. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to talk about it more um, at any time, not just, not just now. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Um, who will be Joyce Williams, um, who does work in immigration, and she will discuss her paper and recommendations on circumventing, circumvention or uh, efficiency and looking at the Attorney General Certification Authority. So Joyce, turn it over to you. Um, thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, everybody. Um, good morning. It is a pleasure um, to really be able to do this under the circumstances. And so 
I am trying to, I'm not sure what's going on with my background, um, but I would, let's see. Let me try to... There's just a light right behind you. Uh, oh, oh I... yeah. But I don't know if turning that light will make it too dark. So, um, yeah, so, we can see, so yeah. Okay. Okay. I think it's, um, let me just adjust, adjust. Okay. Maybe this way. Uh, yeah, we are all. So I will just get straight into it. Um, my background is in law. Um, I studied international law and I do work in international trade um, in focusing on project finance, immigration law, and some business and corporate. I own my own law firm in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I decided to write on the Attorney General certification. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about the broken um, immigration system in the United States and that we've seen its impact in different um, times and different ways. And um, with the new administration coming into effect, starting with the travel bans and other things, um, different policies that had happened, there's been a lot of conversations as to what needs to be done in the immigration system. And we have a Congress that is highly uh, political and divided. So it doesn't seem like a solution is in sight in terms of um, coming together and forming a comprehensive immigration policy but while we are not while we don't have any um, comprehensiveness or any uh, plans to solve the issues of immigration um, when it comes to the United States things are still happening and one of the things that I wanted to throw light on is that um, excessive what one might consider excessive use of certification process by the Attorney General and it depends, it's a, a bit of a debate issue because you could say that because of the broken, uh, brokenness in the systems and the inefficiencies going through the certification process um, makes matters efficient um, in, for the attorney general to set policies and guidelines on immigration issues that needs to be done. Um, on the other side, you can look at it also as a circumvention because instead of having a legislative policy debate and also inviting um, experts and policy um, experts input before a decision is made, um, that, that whole process is bypassed and then it goes straight to um, just few handful of people being able to make a decision. So just a quick background of the certification process, which is, um, a process that law or that power is in the um, Immigration and Nationality Act, um, Section 103A1, and it determines that uh, the Attorney General concerning all questions of law um, has the authority to make a decision and that decision will be controlling. Typically, you've had um, judges reviewing immigration cases um, being sent to uh, through the court and then going to the Board of Immigration Appeals. USCIS um, decisions are swell coming to the uh, Board of Immigration Appeals. And so the certification process typically um, happens when it, a case is referred from either the court or the Board of Immigration's appeal to the Attorney General and then the Attorney General will review it. Uh, past Attorney Generals have used this um, power very less. Uh, we are seeing um, increase of it um, with the current administration. Um, but I think that it goes into the bigger question, um, as we've seen this morning, with our, yesterday with the president announcing that there will be um, close of the U.S. borders stopping immigration. Of course, farmers and health workers are excluded, but it just goes into the deeper questions that we have to ask ourselves and ask our um, legislators in terms of what we are going to do with immigration. Uh, we have seen the impact of immigration in terms of national security as to who is coming in, how people are coming in, the issues on the southern border and even um, on the other uh, borders that are not so busy, people coming in and how they are entering the United States. And then those who are already in the United States, 
without any document uh, documentations, how are we um, able to track and um, really integrate such individuals into the community? And then we have issues with asylum, um, issues with women in domestic violence cases and all of those um, issues. So it just goes to show how um, the lack of comprehensive immigration um, and the excessive use of piecemeal um, solutions to try to address an issue which has a larger and broader implication in one way is really undermining the security, the national security of the United States and its allies. And then it, not only in terms of foreign policy, but really in terms of domestic policy as well, um, resource use um, protection for citizens and protection um, for uh, residents, stories and other things that comes into the United States. So I will end here and we'll be happy to take any questions um, on this topic. Thanks Joyce, those important, important points and important issue. Um, so we're gonna end with Carolyn Washington who actually wrote two papers for us. One on the potential pipeline from the US military to SES in creating greater diversity and the strategic leadership of the US government. And the other one on how Congress can help increase female military leadership at military service academies. Uh, so Carolyn, if you, you have the floor. Is Carolyn still here? Can we hear you? Okay, maybe I don't see Carolyn now. I know Carolyn was here. So Carolyn, are you still here? Here. Okay. You yeah, you may have to turn up your, your volume a bit. Okay. Okay, can you, see, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, thank you. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. My name is Carolyn Washington. I'm a retired Army Colonel. Um, I served there as a foreign area officer. I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Buffalo in New York. And my uh, field is global gender studies. And my research focuses on uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security and its integration within NATO militaries. Um, as Ambassador Jenkins mentioned, I actually authored uh, two policy letters and these policy letters are similar in that they both focus on potential talent outside of the military. One addresses attracting uh, the best pool of candidates, including women of color, to join the military through service military academies, whether the Army's West Point, Air Force, Navy, or Coast Guard service academies. Uh, as military officers, while the other policy letter looks at utilizing the talents of individuals who have already served in the military and in the government's uh, senior, ser senior executive service. Uh, both focus on greater inclusion of women of color. Now, nominees to U.S. service academies are mostly white and male, and they account for 80% of the current service academy nominations by members of Congress. This means that members of Congress serve as gatekeepers, determining to a certain degree, degree the future leadership of the armed forces. So to create a more diverse leadership in the military, I recommend that militaries of Congress De, uh, devise specific programs in their districts in conjunctions with public, private schools, community organizations, et cetera, that target women of color for information sessions about recruitment to service academies. And in my second policy letter encourages the hiring of senior level women of color who have recently retired from the military at the rank of 06 colonels in the Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps, or captains in the Navy or Coast Guard to apply their expertise in the federal government's senior executive service, or SES. So the SES consists of executive positions, managerial, supervisory, and policy, 
in most executive branch agencies of the federal government, such as the Department of Defense, FBI, CIA, National Security Agency, Transportation Security Administration, et cetera. So military expertise can enhance the leadership in these areas, such as intelligence, uh, military attorneys, our staff judge advocates, transportation and finance to name a few, but especially in the area of national security. For example, the foreign area officer, which was my field, serves often, we often serve as military diplomats in US embassies overseas. They're commission officers who are trained, educated, and developed to become regionally focused experts with advanced language skills and cultural awareness training to advise senior military and civilian strategic decision makers. The proposed policy action is to expand existing hiring policies within the Office of Personnel Management to specifically target female veterans in the grade of 06, especially women of color. Thank you. Great, thanks, Carolyn. Okay, so um, I wanna again thank our authors and I also wanna thank uh, Rudra Kapila who's on the line. She was uh, very instrumental in helping to pull these papers together, helping to edit the papers. Uh, Ruja is an expert on climate change and equity issues. And uh, interestingly, in the second, uh, second uh, publication where we talk about the top three issues of concern to women of color based on our survey, uh, climate change was one of the three issues, and I think the first issue. So I asked uh, uh, Ruja if she could just say a couple words on climate change uh, before we have a little bit of time left uh, to see if there's any questions. So, Rudra? Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, good morning, we're still in the morning. Um, absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Bonnie. Um, I'll be very brief. I was not an author. I was one of the editors for this project and uh, really thrilled to have been part of this project, which I affectionately refer to as um, our binder full of women. And uh, this is only the first volume and I hope there will be many more volumes to come. And I'm looking forward to working on the next edition where we will be, where I hopefully will be again compiling uh, policy papers from a range of perspectives um, within this space. Um, and just briefly, um, again, as um, Bonnie mentioned, we have one other publication online on the WCAPS website. Um, it refers to the top three peace and security and foreign policy issues concerning women of color in the US. And um, the top, top one is climate change, gender equity and immigration and migration were mentioned. Uh, Again, we, um, uh, we have um, a climate change working group at WCAPS, uh, for which I am the co-chair, and we had um, some of our delightful members contribute to this first volume, uh, who you've already heard from, uh, Camille Moore and Yuri, um, Yuri Lee. And, um, and just to stress again, the points that they made, you know, women and women of color especially experience climate change impacts differently and often disproportionately negatively um, uh, are impacted by climate change. And um, I, I think climate change was the top issue because it is truly the defining issue of our time and it's intersectional and it uh, crosses it so many sectors. Um, uh, just to put it in context of what's happening Currently, um, there's been studies showing that air pollution impacts um, uh, the number of COVID-19 cases. So, um, you know, it's a very important issue and I hope that we'll bring in some more papers in our next volume that will kind of look at the intersection of climate change and global health. Um, I'll leave it at that, uh, just in case people are curious about my background. I am uh, I'm a climate scientist. Uh, my PhD is in earth science systems. I come from an environmental engineering background, specifically looking at energy. And um, 
uh, happy to answer any questions on the current oil price market crash, um, because that's where I've got my other eye on. So thank you once again. Thanks, Ruja, and thanks for helping out. And also, I want to recognize B. Denise Hawkins, who's also uh, listening. She was also very instrumental in helping us pull together the top policy, uh, top peace and security uh, publication. So thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, B. Denise. We may be reaching out to you again in the future. Um, so we have about, um, you know, a few minutes left. We were going to end at uh, 1130. I was always, I, I teach a course at George Washington and we're doing it online and we were always told not to go far beyond an, an hour. Um, and so, because um, there seems to be a, a tension span about, about uh, doing these Zoom calls. Though I know we've done Zoom calls longer, longer than that. And many of you probably have already. But that seems to be the, the time frame. So we're pushing it a bit uh, uh, with an hour and a half. So we're glad for those who could stay with us. Um, and uh, But very important to have a chance to listen to these wonderful experts. Um, so um, I do want to know if anyone has a question uh, for any of our experts on uh, anything that they've covered. Uh, we do have, uh, I guess you can always uh, raise, your, raise your hand with the, um, um, if you have a question. Um, I know that unfortunately folks who are on Facebook, uh, we're not able to do that. Um, but if anyone, any questions from anyone uh, in the last uh, 13 minutes that we have, um, in the, while people are thinking, I did want, or, and of course, any of these speakers can, can ask a question as well. Um, one thing I didn't do when I talked about my, my paper is I didn't make the connection um, to people on the ground uh, and, and, and people of color on the issues that I, that I talked about on weapons of mass destruction. And I think, you know, there's a lot of history about um, nuclear testing uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in the role that nuclear testing has played in communities of color, particularly indigenous communities. Um, and there's also issues in chemical weapons use um, in Syria and, you know, the effect on women and children and, and uh, disproportionate effect on the use of, uh, of chemical weapons. Um, there is obviously a, a huge lack of diversity in terms of people who are decision makers on issues of weapons of mass destruction, uh, very disproportionate <coughs> for people of color, I can tell you from experience and also from uh, women. <coughs> So um, not only are the effects of these weapons um, very disproportionate, but also the decision-making in terms of uh, the strategies also very disproportionate. I just wanted to say that because I know I did not uh, before. I see Sayoko has a question. <clears throat> yeah, my question is for Stephanie. I thought the mobility presentation was really interesting. And I was wondering, um, especially as a resident of DC and I see a ton of that micro mobility and you know other options. Are there any examples or initiatives that you can think of with these private companies where they are already trying to address equity, or is that not something you've heard much about? Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Actually, there's a couple of different initiatives. Um, Vomada, um, which is um, basically here in DC they actually have a couple of initiatives. One of them is that whenever you are applying, especially if you're a micro mobility company, whenever you are applying to be part of the mix, like the um, here, like if, you, if you're a jump bike and you wanna have 500 jump bikes or something in DC, they're gonna allocate a couple of those for different wards. So for example, like they're going to require, um, require you to have um, um, scooters and bikes and stuff in particular Ward 6, or Ward 7, Ward 8, they want you to not only feed the centers, but also uh, move out to the outskirts of town as well and parts of DC. So those like those types of initiatives exist. Um, but as far as, I mean, especially if we're considering autonomous vehicle technology, there isn't a lot of um, those types of initiatives that basically incentivize these autonomous vehicle companies to work and do their um, pilot list, uh, pilot driverless um, technologies in other parts of the city. 
Um, and now in California, they're trying to have something like that, um, where if you are an AV company, you have to spend 30 hours or something like this per day in this part of the neighborhood versus another part of the neighborhood, but nothing very concrete. That's so interesting. And is mostly local or state and um, local governments that are making that push rather than the companies themselves? Yeah, this is actually a big state. Uh, I mean, sorry, it's a big local government. This isn't necessarily state and it's not federal policy, right? So a lot of states, like you'll see like the big ones that like think of the cities and counties that you would consider to have a, um, a forward thinking transport um, system. Portland, Oregon, Boston, Massachusetts, Washington, DC, these type of places are like in Chicago, Illinois, they're the ones that are sort of leading um, in this conversation, but there's a lot of things that other cities um, and counties can do throughout um, the continent of the United States within any. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. Thank you for bringing your expertise in that. Of course. Thanks. Um, I have a question um, from Andriana, who's on her iPad, and this is for April. Um, uh, she says, she's asked, I was wondering if you saw different levels of religious speaking depending upon if the country has a national religion or how that would work in the US as we're a country that, that espouses religious freedom. Um, so is the question, um, what was the difference in engagement between the countries? Uh, in different, yeah, different levels of religious, um, she said religious speaking, so I guess um, uh, maybe engagement. Okay. Uh, on if the country has a national religion or how would that work in the U.S., which, which where we say, yeah, she said yes, engagement. <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, um, the one that I looked at the most was uh, between, frankly, the U.S. and um, countries um, that formally espouse um, Islam and how we engage with that. And, you know, one hand, we can't control how they um, choose to um, endorse the religion um, to what levels of moderacy or extremism. And in a few papers, um, I noticed that talked about when countering violent extremism or CVE, um, it probably is not in the best, um, or, or it's not in the best uh, idea to, for the US to approach with, let's go with a more moderate and not promote radical one because you're focusing on the ideology. And when you do that, that has the potential to backfire. Whereas if we focus on the community and engaging the gatekeepers of those communities and focusing on the relationships and empowering the relationships towards a more peaceful discourse on, on the things that we do disagree upon, that that gets better, better results as opposed to focusing on, okay, let's bring the ideology back towards center. So on the one hand, other countries, we, we obviously can't control, but what we can do is control how we approach those relationships. Great. Um, I, I am looking, if, if there is a question on Facebook, I can, I am looking at it. So if there is one, please feel free. Um, any other questions before uh, Netta? Okay. Hello, Neda, are you able to ask your question? Can you, can, is there, um, okay, Neda, I guess there was a problem with that. Um, okay, there's a question for, let's see. What was the question for Netta? You having? Are you able to, to join us? If not, uh, there's a question for Camille. And Netta, you can keep trying. Uh, there's a question for Camille. What do women bring differently to water leadership? Hi. Thank you so much for the question. So. I think some of the main things that I examined in the research part of this paper 
was that women's voices are underrepresented when it came to specifically um, the water user committees that we looked at. So if you go through the paper, we talk about some research that comes out of the WASH division of, the U of UNICEF. And basically what they found is that when women were a part of the leadership and managerial teams, what happened was efficiency across the board um, became much more likely. So we talked about consistency of meetings, but also you found that, that um, communication was more collaborative and the women being on the boards actually preempted a lot of issues that might have taken more of a backseat to the profits. So making sure that leakages were not as likely, um, making sure that consumer satisfaction, uh, customer satisfaction was um, just more of a higher priority, you found kind of across the board, um, greater efficiency. Um, one thing that I will say that was actually interesting, um, there was um, an event at the Wilson Center um, close to November, I think of 2019. And I had shared this paper with a woman from um, Uganda and also a woman from Rwanda to kind of ask them for their feedback and what they thought of the findings. And they said, yes, um, inclusion programs that afford more inclusion are important, um, but there are also more barriers there. So it can't just be about um, affirmative mm -hmm. action and making sure that women have a certain percentage of the seats. It's also making sure that the women there are um, landowners, that they're representatives of the actual community. Um, because in their experience, what they found is that women do bring a lot of those qualities that are found in this paper, a lot of those efficiency, um, peace building mechanisms, um, negotiation skills. However, if they're brought onto the boards of these water committees without voting power or without um, a certain level of socioeconomic status that's comparable to the men who they serve with, then those ideas are still um, not as heated and not as um, not as transformative as they could be. So it's it does sound like a simple solution. Women do bring a lot to the table and we're not denying that, but it's also how you implement which can make the greatest impact. So thank you so much for your question. I appreciate it. Thanks, Camille. Um, well, we're, uh, we're at 1128, so we are two minutes away from when we conclude. And I just wanna say a few closing remarks. First of all, thank you for all of you for listening and staying with us. Thank you to all the authors. Thank you to Rudra, B, B, B Denise for all that you did to help with us. We will be soliciting uh, more, um, uh, more publication, more uh, articles for our next publication. Uh, we'll be uh, sending that out to the WCAPS uh, members and putting it on the website. Uh, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, I want to also let you know that uh, we will be having uh, a discussion uh, coming up uh, on May 6th, um, uh, actually May 4th, uh, sorry, uh, call, it'll be titled The Mental Health Impacts of COVID-19 Crisis with uh, someone who is a colleague of mine, Dr. Kimberly Leary, who is an associate professor uh, uh, at the Harvard, um, at the uh, Department of Health Policy and Management uh, and enabling uh, change program director at Harvard Chan School of Public Health, doctor of public health and program um, and associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School, who's actually also a former, who's a classmate of mine from uh, college. Um, and she will be uh, here to talk uh, on uh, issues of uh, mental health and COVID-19. Um, and uh, then we're also gonna be having our New York uh, branch, our New York chapter is uh, hosting an event on May 14th. And it's gonna be uh, looking at COVID-19 and women of color. Uh, so please stay tuned for that. And then we're also gonna be looking at a town hall uh, in early May to uh, for all of the members to learn more about the different working groups of WCAPS. We have uh, 
I think 10 working groups now. Um, and so, you know, uh, we are hoping that uh, uh, those of you who are not members now will join and become members. And you can do that by going to our WCAPS website to get information on that. And uh, through that process, you can join our different um, working groups. So with that, I want to say goodbye. Thank you for joining us for uh, an hour and 31 minutes. Uh, thanks again for uh, everyone who participated. And I am always blown away by the amazing uh, women who are part of WCAPS. Um, I, I, I look at our listserv responses sometime and I look at the signings and the names and the positions, both mid-career, young and seasoned. And it's just, a, just amazing group of women and, and allies. So if you're not a part of it, definitely join. And for those of you who are a part of it, I, can, I look forward to continuing to work with you, okay? So everyone have a nice day, stay safe, stay healthy, stay indoors. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and stay, stay dedicated to the work. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ambassador. Bye. Thank you.